soccer, Douglas Suffield. Doug Suffield was born in Toronto, Canada, is a dual citizen of Canada and the U.S. Doug attended Florida State University and graduated with a triple major in political science, anthropology, and history. After several years in the remote Canadian oil fields as an emergency medical responder, Doug decided to pursue a career in acupuncture and oriental medicine, believing that Eastern medicine coupled with Western medicine would greatly benefit patients living with chronic pain. Doug began his master's program in Gainesville, Florida, but he desired a more challenging experience. So he transferred to AOMA Graduate School of Integrative Medicine in Austin, Texas. While at AOMA, Doug was an enthusiastic student in the school's clinic and was chosen in his senior year to participate in a six-month internship at the Central Texas Veterans Affairs Hospital. Doug has gone on to gain his national board certification in acupuncture and oriental medicine and is fully licensed and accredited by the NCC AOM as a diplomat of oriental medicine. And without further ado, I will go ahead and hand off today's presentation to our speaker, Douglas Suffield. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, very excited to be presenting on this topic today. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and start my share uh, of the screen here. All right. Let's see here. So again, about uh, AI PAMI or the Aging Integrative Pain Assessment and Management Initiative. Uh, it's a comprehensive project addressing non-opioid and non-pharmacological interventions for pain. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and here's a little brief about me. So let's see here. We've already touched on the education, uh, masters. I am currently working on my doctorate for acupuncture and integrative health. As Natalie pointed out, I did work remotely in emergency medical response. I also was involved in construction safety and industrial safety projects up in the remote, remote oil fields of Canada and Alaska. Uh, the internship at the Central Texas VA Hospital, I am completely licensed and I did have my own private practice where I focused on pain, stress management and sports medicine. All right, so to get to the uh, actual topic that we're discussing today, which is virtual reality. So what is virtual reality? Virtual reality means creating immersive computer generated environments, and they are in incredibly convincing for users. So we actually are, will be using uh, visual stimulus and unlike looking, let's say at a television screen or a two dimensional screen, you are completely immersed in the experience. Uh, it is amazingly, involved, you can look 360 degrees and you can participate in the environment. Uh, it's a very hot topic right now for the gaming industry. However, uh, it has been used for training uh, for the military and medical professionals and simulations, flight simulations. Like I said, it is incredibly realistic and that's why um, we're starting to use that for our training because we can simulate real world experiences. So what do these virtual reality headsets look like? There are a number uh, of different headsets. There's ones that are compatible with your phone. So here is one that we use for uh, AI PAMI, the Pain Assessment and Management Initiative, where we do pain coaching in the hospital. So this is one that is completely uh, isolated. You can unfold it and it works with the cell phone. So I've got a cell phone here. When you'd be ready to use it, you would slide it in like, so after you pull up the app that you're willing to use or wanting to use, and you can go ahead and put it on. It also comes with a head strap as well. We also have some other options that range in prices uh, from a couple hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars. Uh, the Oculus is one that is being used right now for, for gaming, uh, and that does seem to be very popular. Uh, we've also got ones like this right here is one that we also use in the hospital. This one is a couple thousand dollars. Uh, it's got preset uh, apps on there that have to do with stress management, pain management, breathing exercises, and mindfulness meditation. The headsets are all wearable like goggles or glasses, so they do uh, come over your head with a head strap. This means that you don't have to hold on to it. You can spend more of your time being immersed in the experience. 
So once you do have a VR headset, uh, the next step is going to be lo to locate applications in the App Store, either Apple or Google Play for your device, whatever is most compatible. Uh, I would suggest trying to search for VR in your App Store to locate free or paid options as you see fit. So really the, the, the point of this presentation is to talk about how virtual reality can be used for pain management. Um, so what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna discuss a brief uh, introduction on pain neuroscience. <clears throat> so what we know now is that pain is interpreted, processed and produced by the, by the brain. Uh, for a long time, we understood pain to be a marker of tissue damage. We believed that nerves would send painful stimulus to the brain. Uh, however, uh, the more we've studied pain and, and in recent years, we've noticed that this is not true. Uh, what nerves do is they actually transport information, what we will call here as danger signals. Uh, they send information of probable danger, uh, usually based on either mechanical stimulus, thermal stimulus, acid stimulus, or light stimulus. Now, what uh, happens is when these danger signals reach a critical point, uh, they will fire and they will send a message to the brain. Now, still no pain has been produced. Uh, the brain is still gonna be the last step that decides how much pain to elicit in response to these danger signals. Um, and before the pain or before the brain decides how much pain to start with, it will enlist different departments, uh, all housed in different areas of our brain, but primarily they deal with the memories of past issues of pain, uh, current emotional state, thoughts, beliefs about pain. Uh, and unfortunately, when we are in pain, when things do happen to us like uh, accidents, uh, whether they're sports injuries or, um, you know, motor vehicle accidents, we always tend to go to the worst case scenario, especially if we have been in pain like this before we start thinking of how long will I be in pain? How bad is this pain going to be? Uh, will I have to miss work? All these other kinds of uh, emotions and thoughts and stressors are elicited just from being in pain. So uh, we have found out that these memories, uh, current emotional state, thoughts and beliefs about pain directly impact the amount of pain that the brain decides to uh, elicit. Now, uh, a good a couple examples we have here for uh, kind of challenging the idea that pain is a direct uh, result of tissue damage. Uh, one would be minimal damage, uh, however, with severe pain, which is the uh, always dreaded paper cut. And it has been shown that they do hurt worse at work. Uh, another example would be severe tissue damage with minimal pain. Uh, so that would be, again, motor vehicle accidents, sports injuries. For the most part, these don't actually start hurting until the day after or until a couple hours after the initial uh, trauma or accident. And the reason for this is that, again, the brain is protective. Pain is a protective uh, uh, produced by the brain, it is protective in all of its nature. So the brain will actually realize that when you're in an accident that is a large vehicular accident or sports injuries, it will say, well, we don't need to create pain right now because it's more important for us to get out of the environment, to finish the game. And until we're home safe or in the hospital, really does those pain markers start uh, exacerbating in our body. And another one that is very interesting is when dealing with veterans at the VA, a lot of them would report pain in limbs that they no longer had attached to their bodies. So a lot of them, uh, I remember a direct example was a patient that came in and he had uh, been, uh, he was an amputee. He did not have any leg below his knee. However, he would always come in and he had uh, foot pain. He would come in and say that his foot was cramping, even though he no longer had a foot attached to that limb. So there is another example of just how complicated and how involved the brain is in creating pain. So it is not just a marker for tissue damage. So what does this have to do with VR? Well, we've already established that thoughts, feelings, emotional states regarding our environment have a direct effect on our sense of danger and safety. Like I touched on before, the brain and the nervous system exist to keep us safe to increase our chances of survival. Uh, over millennia of evolution, uh, we've learned and our brains have learned to make quick assessments of dangerous situations and either elicit the response to run or to fight. So there's the fight or flight response, uh, which is called the sympathetic nervous system. I'm sure many people have heard of that. Uh, and then there's the parasympathetic nervous system, which has more to do with rest and relaxation and repair. 
Um, so there is, a, again, another example. So if we feel that we're in danger, our brain will produce the same hormones as if we're in real life or death situations. It does not take the chance that the danger isn't real. Uh, a great example and what I like to talk about with patients in the emergency department is the example of a scary movie. We can, you know, turn on a scary movie. We understand that it's not real. We know it's uh, going to pose no danger to us. We're in our house. We're on our couch. Doors are locked. You know, we've got our bowl of popcorn. And yet our heart rate will still go up. We'll still become jumpy. We might scream. Uh, you know, palms get sweaty. Even after the movie's off, we'll be looking around corners, turning lights on, probably won't sleep that well that night. And all while, the whole, the whole time, we knew that we weren't in any real danger, but our brain did not take the chance that whatever we were watching wasn't gonna hurt us. So we can utilize VR to reduce these danger signals uh, by sending new signals to the brain. Uh, we can actually reduce the sensitivity of the brain to these danger signals. So just like, uh, you know, after watching that scary movie, noises become heightened, you see things out of the corner of your eyes. And that's because your body has increased your sensory sensitivity in order to protect you. The earlier we can assess a dangerous situation, the quicker we can react to it. So our body becomes hypersensitive. This also means that our body can become hypersensitive to pain. Um, so when we utilize VR to reduce these danger signals or increase safety signals, uh, it reduces production of stress hormones, it lowers our emotional stress, it reduces mental agitation, and actually decreases pain sensitivity. So we're gonna play a couple of games here. Uh, the first one is gonna be a word-based game. So I just want everyone to take a moment. We're gonna spend a couple minutes on this slide. And just uh, when we talk about these, when I say these phrases, just pay attention to how you feel, uh, where your mind goes, any thoughts or beliefs or anything like that. So the first one, the dreaded bone on bone. Wear and tear. Slipped disc. The worst blank injury, sprain, break I've ever seen. So how do these sound in your head? You know, bone on bone, I even just saying it, I can feel the grating nature of how I assume that would feel just in, in my head. Wear and tear, I mean, actually the idea that we describe normal joint aging as wear and tear, I, I mean, you can feel the ripping quality of that. Slipped disc, uh, again, a colloquialism that we use uh, where does your disc slip to? You know, is it going to fall out of your back? It sounds very uh, dangerous. You know, all of these are increasing those danger signals or, you know, being told it's the worst case of whatever I've ever seen from a doctor. Um, you know, all of these immediately start raising those feelings of uh, protection from danger from our body naturally. So did they produce any emotions, any thoughts or memories? Possibly some of you joining today might have been told some of these. And what we've actually seen is when patients are, are told these, they can actually increase the pain versus patients you know, that were told instead of um, wear and tear, something that is easily said to say, oh, you've got normal joint aging, which happens to all of us, by the way. So now we're gonna take it a step further. So I will say that some of these following images may be a little bit disturbing for some viewers. They are meant to elicit some emotions. So I did try to keep them as uh, safe as possible while still eliciting some of these uh, feelings for us all to really witness. Uh, I really would like you to pay attention to the emotions that these images conjure in your mind, any feelings, uh, whether they're physical or mental, you know, like uh, jaw clenching, any tension, uh, you know, make balling up our fists, increased heart rate, and really try to pay attention to the memories or thoughts that bubble up with these images. You know, there possibly could be some past traumas or accidents, times that you did not feel safe is really what we're focusing on. So here we go. All right, we're almost done. All right, 
I know it was quick, but it still should have served the purpose. How is everyone feeling? Uh, what were some of the emotions, the memories and thoughts that were felt while viewing those imagings, images? Sorry. <clears throat> were the emotions you know, or feelings, were they positive? Were they negative? I mean, I would assume most of us felt some negativity, some stress, especially with things uh, such as the COVID numbers, even just the, the color red can be very disturbing. It's something we use uh, you know, with our stop signs, with our traffic signs, um, with uh, danger signals everywhere. It's also used in nature. Uh, you know, a lot of animals will incorporate, poisonous animals incorporate bright colors to allow others to realize that they are poisonous. And even some animals have become very ingenious in utilizing bright colors that aren't poisonous, but they realize that in uh, the world of nature, bright colors mean stop. Bright colors mean danger. And we've incorporated that same idea in our society. As with um, the fear of darkness, that's something that is uh, with the second slide, the, primarily the, the darker slide, our fear of the dark is something that is ingrained into us biologically. Before we were in our houses or before we had electricity, you know, things happened in the dark that were dangerous, that were uh, in need of protecting. So we do get the fear of the dark, even just naturally when we're born. So again, some of us might have felt an increased heart rate, clammy hands, clenched jaw, neck tightness. Some people can feel it in their stomach. So I mean, paying attention and I will ask some questions and I'll open it up uh, at the end just for us to discuss this. And again, did you feel relaxed or on edge? Now, most of us should have felt a little on edge. It should have been a little uh, disturbing to see some of those images. If you felt relaxed, then I mean, that's a totally <laughs> other conversation we'll have to have. And is anyone still feeling upset, uh, upset, unsafe, or in danger? And if there is anybody in the chat, uh, I can't see it, but if there is, uh, we can go ahead and address that. If not, I'm going to move on. So, Doug, the only thing I do want to point out, um, Dr. Chaffetz had mentioned that you know, when you talk about some of the terminology that providers might use with a patient, some of those unfortunate terms um, that have stuck around over time are really damaging to patients. And a lot of providers are working really hard now in order to change the way they describe and explain pain to people for that reason, because it, it does communicate hopelessness versus the ability to heal or the ability to live a good quality of life after you hear some of those things. Exactly. And um, I don't mean to, to judge or, or to pass any type of um, ill will onto the people that use those. It's just, it's, uh, I completely agree. And we are seeing that in the studies that it does increase uh, feelings of hopelessness. Um, I also want to point out that a lot of us, you know, speak this way to ourselves. We use very negative um, connotation and, and uh, self-talk, even without knowing it. So um, I do agree with that. And again, I'm glad that we can start to learn that, you know, what we, what we think and how we speak and things like that have a direct reflect on our feelings of safety and also on our health. So, all right, if anybody else, if no one else is feeling unsafe, we can gonna go ahead and move on to the next. So what did we just learn? So none of us were in any real danger, but our brains did not make that differentiation. Thinking about danger and or being exposed to learned and cultural fears elicits physiological changes. And again, we've talked about how uh, this is subconsciously done. It is done out of a need to protect and survive. Uh, so we might have all felt the danger being expressed in our body, mind, and emotions. We start to get a little on edge, heart races. So even though we were not in any real danger, these physiological responses do happen. And another thing I'd like to focus on is, you know, really what we're, we're doing here and what we're doing as part of the program in the emergency department is bringing the mindfulness to these emotions. Now, there is no good emotion or bad emotion. There is no positive or negative. Every emotion we feel is exactly what it is. It serves a purpose. And so we can either choose to be carried away by these emotions or we can cultivate the space between the things that happen to us and the way we react to them. And that is really where a lot of patients find this empowering nature to be able to assess these emotions that are bubbling up in us 
and then decide how they want to react to them. So what do you think happens in our bodies when we are exposed to these perceived dangers every day? So we turn on the news, we, the conversations we have with coworkers, with our friends, with our family, um, the, the stressors that we read about in the newspaper or on our feeds on Instagram and Facebook. I mean, it is, it is everywhere. And when you're in an environment that is stress inducing to feel stressed is the natural response. However, uh, what we're realizing now is that we are not able to escape the amount of information and the stressors that we're exposed to every day. And it isn't only just our stressors we're exposed to, we are exposed to worldly stressors, things that are going on everywhere and in every part of the uh, globe. So being able to witness these, witness the emotions and the things that are uh, brought up inside of us without getting carried away by them is really uh, what we're trying to do when we cultivate this mindfulness. So really it's all about balance. So just like how certain colors like red and yellow can trigger danger signals, other signal or other colors, excuse me, like blue and green can actually trigger safety signals. <clears throat> the same can be said for emotions, feelings, and thoughts. The more positive the emotion or feeling or thought, the stronger its safety signals are and the greater the impact on our brain chemistry. So again, another little game here is how do these phrases make you feel? So the road to recovery, safe and sound, rest and relaxation, normal bone or joint aging. Uh, we're gonna go on a little vacation here. So we've got some beautiful, you know, we've got a nice you know, green background, very safe, sitting here by the beach, some good food. This is again, illustrating that you know, while I talked earlier about how certain colors like red and yellows can elicit danger signals, uh, depending on the connotation and depending on the environment, here we can see that red and yellows, you know, do not pose any danger unless maybe if you were allergic to any of these foods. Um, but here, just because we're exposed to these learned cultural colors and fears associated with them doesn't mean that we can't unlearn them. And nice tranquil lily beautiful sunset. We're going to keep on going for this for a little bit. We've got again, a nice tranquil temple, good quality time spent with friends and family, eating good food, laughing, a lot of things, unfortunately, that we aren't able to do right now with everything that's happened this past year because of COVID. So <clears throat> and a couple more nice and relaxing uh, beaches. And not to complicate it too much, but for the most of us, this should feel nice and relaxed. But again, just to illustrate how you know, everyone's different is you know, the one on the bottom right, if someone, let's say, wasn't able to swim or they had had a bad instance at the beach, uh, let's say uh, run in with a stingray or a jellyfish, maybe this would not be as, as safe for them. So again, it is all very based on our individual lives and experiences, emotions and memories surrounding pain. So again, how is everyone feeling? Those images should have been a lot more uh, enjoyable for everybody. So again, the emotions and memories and thoughts that were felt while viewing those images, uh, emotions feeling mostly positive or mostly negative. How does the body feel when we view these images? Does it feel, you know, we can almost feel the relaxation of the sun, of, we can hear the waves, we can remember the last time we were spending quality time with our family and friends around a good, healthy meal. All of these will trigger our parasympathetic nervous system. That's that rest and digest and relax and rebuild. You know, it decreases heart rate. It reduces, you know, jaw tension, neck tension, stomach upsets, you know, we should actually feel our body begin to relax and calm down. And when it's able to calm down and relax, you know, pain is reduced, our ability to regenerate and, and rebuild our tissues is increased. So really trying to spend as much time in this parasympathetic response or get back to it as quickly as we can when we are brought into that sympathetic, that fight or flight response is very beneficial for patients to realize that they can 
control some of these responses. You know, we, we don't have control over much. There's a lot of things that happen in our life that are outside of our control. Um, however, we can cultivate, that I touched on earlier, that space between what happens to us and how we react to it. And by being able to realize that there is a subtle space for growth and mindfulness in that space between what happens to us and, and how we react is very beneficial, even with pain, which is the main thing that we are here today to discuss. So quick recap, the more danger signals that are being transported to the brain, whether they are physical, mental, or emotional, the more likely the brain is to become hypervigilant of these signals out of protection. This means that only a small amount of additional stimulation is needed to trigger the brain to produce a full-blown protective response. And for the most time, or the most part, it is pain. Um, it can also be stress. Uh, however, stress and pain are greatly related. I like to, to discuss this concept with patients. You know, some of these things we're talking about are, are theoretical. Some of them are a little abstract. Uh, so I do like to use the example of a house alarm. Uh, so our pain response, again, is rooted in a need to protect us from danger to increase our chances of survival. <clears throat> so just like a house alarm, it keeps things out. It keeps us safe. When something tries to, to break down our, our house, when something you know, breaks our skin or, or gets into us like a virus, the alarms go off. And that's great. That's good. That's exactly what pain is supposed to do. It is supposed to alert us that something is not how it's supposed to be, which then has us either change our behaviors or go and seek help at the hospital or to a doctor or to find out what it is is actually wrong and causing these, these alarms to go off. But let's say we set that alarm very, very high and it was very, very sensitive. So instead of someone banging on your front door, um, it could only be a leaf or a squirrel runs across the, the front porch and all of the alarms go off. And that's because our, our pain sensories, our, our pain sensitivity, our brain is so focused on protecting us because of all of these danger signals, uh, stress about finances, about work, uh, memories of being in pain, um, the longer we're in pain, you know, little things can trigger us. So even just the fear of, is this going to set me into another uh, flare up of my pain, all of these safety or danger signals, I'm sorry, add up. And so that makes our alarm system very, very sensitive. Um, so on the flip side, the more safety signals that are transported to the brain, the lower the amount of danger signals and the lower the need for protection. And these safety signals were illustrated with some of those images, but also the words we use to describe ourselves and our situations and our pain and our health, um, the things we choose to pay attention to, um, whether they are primarily stress inducing or relaxation reducing. Do we spend enough time in that parasympathetic nervous system response? All of these things can help lower our amount of pain and our per uh, perception of pain. So VR works in the same way as the images, actually it works even better because unlike looking at a two dimensional screen with the virtual reality, you are completely immersed in the experience. So these are some of the images from, the, from VR. And again, you can, you can see these images, it allows us to do things that normally we aren't able to do because of our mobility issues, because of COVID-19, uh, because of fears that we're not able to do these things. So we can actually, um, there are some apps that are amazing. You can you go to Rome, you can uh, have a walking tour of Egypt, you can do all these amazing things, you can go scuba diving. Um, so sending all of these positive safety signals to our brain, you know, we are, we are meant to explore our environment. We are meant to, to move and be mobile and to enjoy our lives and to spend time doing the things that make us feel good. So when we're in chronic pain, when we're not able to do these things, it can be very challenging to find outlets that allow us to, to do these and allow us to relax. So that's where VR is a great addition to pain management plans. So VR is a fully immersive reality. 
it stimulates not only our visual areas of our brain, but it also accesses and turns on other parts of our brain. It releases endogenous opioids, endorphins, neurotransmitters, when coupled especially with belly breathing and mindfulness meditation. And mindfulness meditation, um, there might be some stigmas or some things that we've attached to that. It might seem a little mystic or woo-woo, uh, but with mindfulness meditation, we've already touched on it. It is just cultivating that space between what happens to us and how we react to those things. It is witnessing our emotions, our feelings, uh, the senses, our sensory response to all these things, witnessing them, experiencing them, but not letting them carry us away to remain grounded in, in now and grounded in how we choose to react to these, uh, these things and these, these events and the stimulus that uh, are evoked in us. So VR is the ultimate distraction tool and can be used to increase safety signals to your brain. When we talk about distraction tools, um, I know the connotation to distraction, we hear a lot when you know school related, you're distracted, you're not paying attention, it's a negative thing. Uh, when we're talking to somebody and we're not present, we're distracted. But how we utilize these for pain management is, is a different connotation to it. So if I were to turn on, or if, if you were to turn on a TV or a radio in your house and you were able to sit down across from it, you could pay attention you could follow the words of the song, you could hear the beat and everything like that. Uh, so that's basically what's going on when we're in pain. There is a constant flood of information and our brain has decided that it is dangerous, uh, that we are in pain and that we remember all of our past pains. So it's listening to this, this stimulus and it's creating pain. Now, if we were to, to turn on three different radios playing three different songs or turn on three other TVs playing three different TV shows, you will not be able to focus at the same percentage or the same strength that you were able to focus on the original stimulus before we turned on all these other uh, TVs and, and radios. And that's just because our brain is only able to process so much information consciously at a time. I and mean, we are constantly uh, decoding information about our environment through our senses, through our perceptions. But when we can actually harness these signals and use things like virtual reality, uh, deep breathing techniques, hot or cold therapies, aromatherapy, anything that we can do to distract and send new signals to the brain actually decreases the sensation and the uh, experience of pain naturally. So again, by, by increasing the amount of positive stimulus to the brain, and positive stimulus can be anything. It could be quality time with family. It can be uh, things that make you feel fulfilled, uh, but when we increase these, it lessens the brain's ability to interpret pain stimulus. And again, pain stimulus is just dangerous information or danger signals from the brain, from the tissues. So uh, again, just like the previous example of using different radios and TVs, it's the longer we're in pain, the higher our sensitivity to information, um, to dangerous information and stimulus. It is like having a song stuck in our head. Uh, the first couple notes, you know, the first couple uh, sensations or, or amount of information that's sent, let's say from the tissues or from a certain area that has been uh, injured, the brain will not wait for more stimulus to show up. It already knows this song and it'll immediately trigger pain. And again, it is because the brain is trying to skip some steps to protect you. So versus waiting around until the song has been turned up and it's you know cranked in your brain, your brain will immediately say, okay, well, I've, I've, I've heard this song before. I know how this works. We're gonna go ahead and we're gonna jump right to the end and we're gonna make some pain to protect, to uh, not elicit any more danger to let's say, uh, if it's a low back pain or a knee pain, when it starts, you know, immediately it becomes painful. And so we, we lay down, we sit down. And when we lay down, sit down, get off of it, we are protecting that tissue. And the brain thinks it's doing a good job. Unfortunately, it's no longer protecting us. It's actually harming our ability to uh, experience good quality of life and to do the things that we want to do that make us feel fulfilled, independent, raising our efficacy and empowerment. So what the research says. So virtual reality sessions may reduce a patient's perceived pain as demonstrated by studies with inpatient hospitalized patients. 
patients immersed in virtual reality have displayed a higher pain tolerance, which could reduce the dosage and frequency of pain medication required for relief. One such example that I have read uh, is for burn management. So during the course of a burn, uh, patients have to be scrubbed and, and the skin has to be kept clean and free of debris and infection, and it's very painful. So uh, there was a study done where patients uh, were put into virtual reality and the pain was significantly reduced. So again, the reported pain has been reduced in instances of both acute and chronic pain. Just like I spoke about earlier, there is a very large connection between stress, anxiety, and pain. So virtual reality uh, used as a distraction tool may reduce the time it takes a provider to complete simple anxiety-producing procedures like IV placements and injections. Time spent thinking about pain was reduced in certain studies, which may be promising for anxiety and a reduction in repetitive thoughts and fix fixations. Excuse me. Mindfulness and meditation programs are being specifically designed to help users receive the benefit of such techniques without some of the barriers to access. Mm -hmm. So um, naturally, mindfulness meditation is something that is very beneficial. Uh, a lot of information is out there regarding mindfulness meditation. I also, you know, how, however, we also have some connotations and some of our own beliefs about it where you know, I just wanna dispel any thoughts that you do not need to be a monk to, to meditate. You do not need to, you know, have your incense burning and your singing bowls and everything like that to meditate properly. There is no right or wrong way to meditate. If you're trying to meditate and if you've made the time and the space for you to have this experience, then you're already on the path of meditation and you're already doing great. So you should um, pat yourself on the back that you have already decided to, to try some of these. We get so hung up on the right and wrong way to do it. We kind of lose sight of what it is and it is just to, to sit and breathe and focus on how we are feeling to really check in with ourselves we spend so much time projected into the future about you know tomorrow and the next day and all of these things that could happen that might happen or we are living in the past and we ruminate on on past things that we would have done differently or regrets that we may have and unfortunately we miss the now moment which you know regardless of when things happen to us they always happen now and they always are happening in a constant now. So being able to bring ourselves into this moment and check in with our body is very, very healing for both our mind and our physical body. So there are some safety concerns with VR. Um, one would be if you have a history of motion sickness, vertigo, um, seizures, then definitely uh, VR might not be the safest way to go for distraction techniques. The good thing is that there are other options for you. Uh, like hot and cold therapy, aromatherapy, mindfulness meditation, uh, self-hypnosis, positive affirmations, all of these can be very beneficial. Uh, ensure that your area uh, you're moving around in is free of trip hazards. I would suggest using a swivel chair, something that you can move 360 degrees, as again, the virtual reality is completely immersive. That's where it shines as a treatment. So being able to put on the virtual reality and, and look around and move around is uh, the whole point, but we just wanna make sure that you're not gonna trip. So, you know, not putting the VR headset on and being near any stairs or you know, coffee tables or things like that. So definitely be aware of the uh, environment that you're in. And try sitting in a chair during your first few sessions. I would recommend sitting in a chair for all of your sessions. Uh, again, it limits the risk and it still allows you to experience uh, the virtual reality. And select virtual reality videos that make you feel comfortable, uh, not scenes that you would be uncomfortable or afraid of in real life. Uh, for example, swimming with sharks if you have a fear of sharks. Uh, there's also some video games that are quite um, startling, quite uh, intense. So I wouldn't recommend doing those either. All right, so I think that is the end of it. I really appreciate everyone uh, for their time and their attention. Uh, so now we will open up uh, the floor to any questions. And again, touching on any uh, emotions or feelings that you felt during either of the two uh, sessions of those pictures, I'd be happy to, to talk about those or to share some experience. Sure. Thank you, Doug. That was a great presentation. Um, if you want to go ahead and stop your screen share, I'll pull up mine and then um, we can go ahead and get into a couple of comments that we've already received.
And then we also have a couple of questions as well. So now is the time for our discussion and Q&A portion for today's webinar. So if you do have anything that you'd like to ask of our panelists today, uh, just let us know either via the chat feature or the Q&A feature. That would be really helpful for us so we can get those answered for you. If you've not submitted one, you can go ahead and do that now. And um, a comment that we had that I wanted to share, there's a few of them that came in, but um, Debbie was just mentioning that she has a couple of Pinterest boards that she likes to use that have relaxing images and using the color blue and green and things that she finds calming to her personally. And so she does that in order to give herself a little escape. So I thought that that's really a great use of Pinterest and the internet. So, you know, even if it's not as fantasy as virtual reality and something that's very high tech, you can just have a couple of images maybe that you flip through if you're having a difficult day at work that has kind of the same idea behind it as virtual reality. Um, Dr. Chaffetz, too, along that same vein, encouraging patients to engage in any activities that divert the mind so that you don't focus on pain are definitely recommended. That goes as well for the treatment environment that you're being put in when you're being treated for your pain. So looking for those kinds of providers and environments that do make you feel safe and good and relaxed, um, it definitely helps you in order to feel relaxed and reduce that anxiety and stress. Um, and then we had a question from Dawn. She was asking, how long do the effects of VR typically last? So I guess we can answer that, um, Doug, if you want to, in like a twofold. So how long would you recommend a VR session be in general? And then how long would you say that the effects are from that session? For sure, uh, it's a great question. Um, so it is dependent on uh, the patient on how long they've been in pain, let's say. Uh, also where they are in just their, their path and their, their healing uh, and their rehabilitation. So patients that have already experienced or done some work with um, you know, positive affirmations, uh, deep breathing exercises, then they, they put on these uh, headsets. And usually we do about 20 minutes. Uh, that seems to be very beneficial for our, for our patients. Um, while they are in the environment, the virtual reality, I do encourage them to um, breathe deeply, to focus on cultivating these, uh, the positive self-talk and, and the positive affirmations. And that really enhances the ability of these VR headsets. You know, if you go into the experience with a mindset, you know, this is not gonna work. This is, you know, why am I doing this? Things like that can kind of be a block to the effects of the treatment. If you go in and you experience it for what it is, I mean, it, it's amazing that this is the technology that we have. So I usually see patients, um, they do have reduction in pain with, within a short period of time. Uh, and that reduction could be moving from, let's say a seven to a, to a six, seven to a five. Uh, but they do, it gives them the hope. And that's really what we're, we're trying to do is raise efficacy, raise empowerment, increase those feelings of hope with patients. And even getting just a couple steps right away of reduction or, or you know, mark it down from a seven to a five, it gives patients a great feeling of empowerment because they realized, okay, well, that was one session. And, you know, now I've got a tool that I can utilize, let's say if my pain does come back or even utilize when some of these feelings, you know, like I, I touched on with uh, COVID-19 and everything, hopefully knock on wood, we can start getting back to some semblance of normalcy soon, but feelings, you know, not being able to experience our environment or, or to, to go out and, and do things. So this would be a great, uh, way to also combat some of those and get ahead of the effects of it. If our pain isn't necessarily bad, we can still get there if our mind starts feeling, you know, lonely or uh, those feelings of hopelessness or frustration or things. So um, about 20 minutes a day. Um, but the good thing is, is that you can't really overdo it. Uh, if you don't have any of those comorbidities of um, motion sickness, of uh, seizures or things like that, then there's really nothing you can't overdo it with the virtual reality especially if you're using it as a tool uh, so hopefully that answered the the question there yes i definitely think so so would you say that um, people who are interested in using virtual reality um, even with a simplified sort of viewer do you think that they should speak with their doctors about their interest in virtual reality so that they can inform them that they are using it 
Sure, I, I, it's never uh, a bad idea to increase communication with your provider. Uh, the more information they have, the more uh, ability they have to, you know, track your your progress and to be on board. So, uh, and vice versa, being able to communicate with people inherently just makes us feel safe and makes us feel taken care of. Um, so, I would definitely suggest talking to a provider, talking, letting them know that you're utilizing it. Um, also, there are certain uh, apps that track how many hours or how many minutes that you're doing in the virtual reality. And those are based basically around uh, the mindfulness meditations and breathing exercises. So it's great to be able to look back and see, hey, I did, I did an hour this week, or I did, you know, 40 minutes or 10 minutes, whatever it is, it's a great start to be able to track uh, just that you are putting in the time for self care. Uh, and if you know that you're putting in the time, and you know that it's something that you're working on, two things happen. One, all of those feelings of safety and those safety signals get increased. And two is you realize that the virtual reality is a great first step, especially for people that are interested in mindfulness meditation. Uh, once you realize that you can get into that state without the virtual reality, where you can actually get to a point um, where let's say you're in traffic and you know someone cuts you off and there's a lot of stress and you're late for a meeting or something, all of these start even just talking about it, I can feel myself getting a little bit uh, stressed out, but you can actually, you know, in traffic, again, being safe, not traveling or not moving, you can close your eyes and, and visualize your favorite virtual reality. You can actually, because that work's been done, you can call on that memory in your brain and you can put yourself right there, take three or four breaths and you can feel the effects almost immediately. So the beautiful thing about this work is that the more you do it, the more you practice it, the easier it is for you to get back into that uh, state of mind. Great, hey, thank you. And then we, we did have another suggestion as well. So in addition to virtual reality, kind of expanding on the experience, um, Dr. Chaffetz was pointing out too, you can use some aromatherapy and essential oils just to increase sensations going on while you're using maybe a more relaxing virtual reality experience. You can dim the lights so that way you don't have lights competing with your phone and everything like that while you're using it. And maybe if the app doesn't already have music, a lot of them do have some really great, great sounds, nature sounds and music. Maybe you turn on some music while you're doing that all again, just to help you build on that escape, even though it is a virtual one. Um, but I don't see any additional questions. If you have any um, concluding remarks, Doug, and then I'm going to go ahead and pop our post survey into the chat box and then we can conclude from there. Sure. Um, in terms of uh, maybe a, a good time to do it. I would say earlier in the morning or middle of the day, I would refrain from probably doing it uh, before bed only because the blue lights from our cell phones and some of these technologies have actually been shown to decrease the melatonin that we produce when the sun goes down. So a lot of people are familiar with melatonin to take as a sleep aid. Uh, you know, there is also a lot of, of correlation between getting a good rest and pain uh, levels. You know, when we rest, we rebuild and, and we rejuvenate our body. Uh, we can even transfer short memory to long-term memory. So, you know, getting restful sleep is very important. So when we are exposed to blue lights, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of people look at their cell phone before bed or they watch TV, uh, but the blue light actually diminishes our natural production of melatonin. So maybe not doing it right before bed, but maybe, you know, doing it within or uh, two hours before bed would be fine. Perfect. Thank you for that. And um, so someone was asking about this. And again, as a reminder, if you completed our pre and our post survey, uh, you do um, become eligible to be mailed out our virtual reality cardboard viewer. So that's the one that you can use with your smartphone or iPod. Um, you can use it with an Android device, an iPhone, it doesn't have to be a specific brand or anything like that. So that cardboard viewer can become yours if you can help us give us some feedback on how the session was today on the topic, topics you'd like to see in the future. You can definitely let us know. Um, also, all of you have my email address from uh, me sharing information with you. So just go ahead and shoot me an email. It's up on the screen as well as in addition to Doug's. So if you have questions, uh, if you are interested in anything, uh, just please send us an email. We're happy to help put you in touch with people, happy to help share tools and resources that we have with you. That's up on the screen. 
Also, today's recorded presentation will be shared with everyone. Um, so you'll be able to get that via email. I'll send that out to everyone so you can have the slides for reference. You can have all of Doug's presentation for you to reference in the future when you go to use your Cardboard VR viewer, we will provide you with a brochure. It also is currently on our website under virtual reality, our brochure that has a couple of different apps that you can locate in your app store on your smartphone. And those you're able to download and use with a virtual reality low tech device, such as a Google Cardboard, like the one that we'll provide to you. Um, and if there's no additional questions or anything else today, again, that post survey, I'll drop it in there just one more time. I will also email it out if you don't catch it in the chat box. And we just ask for your feedback and we hope you enjoyed today's presentation. If you have any additional questions, want more information, we do encourage you again, reach out to us, check out our website. If you just search PAMI, at UF, as in University of Florida, you'll be able to find our website. We have a lot of great resources and tools on there for you. But um, if there's nothing else further today, then we'll go ahead and conclude our presentation. And again, thank you to Doug and thank you to everyone who is in attendance today. We'll get all of this emailed over to everyone who attended. And we hope you have a great rest of your afternoon.